is a time when all young people feel the need for freedom to explore new horizons. They are impatient and eager to discover life. But between their eagerness and life's promises stands one unpredictable obstacle, their parents. Blue room, gosh. I've never been to the blue room. Me neither. That ever be something. Bet no one in the whole class will think of going there after the dance. The blue room. Gosh, that's the dreamiest idea I've heard yet. But count me out. You know how strict my father is. Parents are sure tough. I'm bound to get a battle out of mine. But let's try, all of us. Even you, Jane. It's worth a try. Ah, oh, you guys have it easy. Parents are rougher on girls. They just don't understand. Well, what's the difference? They treat us all like babies. Yeah. Man. Here are six young people complaining about their parents. Are parents hard to live with? Don't they understand the younger generation at all? Or does the young generation misunderstand parents? Well, I don't know what young people are thinking of these days. No discipline, no consideration, no sense of the value of money. Everything seems so old-fashioned to them. No sense of responsibility. Absolutely. You know, they get too much freedom, too much money. I used to think we had problems when Betty was little. Couldn't wait to see her grow. Oh, it's the old story. Little kids, little problems. Big kids, big problems. Apparently, somebody sees this question a little differently. Could it be that teenagers are hard to live with, too? Maybe there are two sides to the question. Let's follow Betty inside and get better acquainted with the Andersons. Mother! Mother! Guess who asked me to the class dance? Who? Jimmy Allen! Oh. I can go, can't I? Well, of course you can oh, go. Oh, I'm so happy. See, and you thought you'd never break into the new crowd. I thought I was going to be that new girl forever. <laughs> Jimmy's going to drive, and Jane and Mary and their dates are coming with us. And afterwards, Mother, we're going to the Blue Room. Oh, the blue Everyone's going to die of envy. Oh, the Blue Room. That's that cranky place with the name band and the floor show. You know, Betty, I like your new friends. They're, they're nice children. Children? And I know you're going to need a new dress, dear. Well, I don't know about the blue room afterwards, dear. But, Mother, I've got to go where the crowd goes. Well, let's wait and talk to Dad before we get so upset. I just heard his car drive up. He'll be in in a minute. Hello, dear. <laughs> oh, oh, Dad. Frank, Frank, I'm so glad you're home early. Uh, Guess what happened? What's that? Jimmy Allen has invited Betty to the class dance. Formal, no less. Jimmy Allen, eh? Well, it uh, seems to me I've heard you mention him before. Oh, Father. Well, what's wrong? They want to go to the Blue Room afterwards. The Blue Room? Oh, no. No, that's out. The class dance is all right, but no Blue Room. But, Father, I've got to go where the crowd goes. No, no, it brings me out again. No, Betty, it isn't as bad as all that. It is. It's worse. Betty's deeply hurt. From her point of view, her parents are being very hard. But from her parents' point of view, Betty is asking too much. It's an argument that can be solved only by compromise. But at Betty's age, it is difficult to accept compromise. Let's hear what Jimmy's father thinks about their plan to go to the Blue Room. Hi, Dad. Hello, son. Where are you going? Taking out a client. What's on your mind? Well, don't forget, you promised I could have the car for the class dance, Dad. I told the kids I'd drive. I won't forget. But you have to put in the gas. And you have to wash it. Wish I didn't have to go tonight. Didn't I wash it last time? Yes, well, I told you you couldn't have it again if you didn't. Incidentally, I want to know what time you get home. Your mother worries when you have the car. I know how to drive, and I'm careful. I'm always careful. You probably are, Jimmy, most of the time. But you don't have to cause an accident to be in one. I saw a car last night with at least 10 kids jammed into it. Oh, don't worry, Dad. There are only six of us. And six in Bill Swanson's car. Mm-hmm. Gee, Dad, why, why do you always have to act like a state's attorney when I want to borrow the car? Jimmy's revolt against his inquisitive father is genuine. Regardless of his father's reasons for asking so many questions, Jimmy resents it. Oh, but here they come. Let's listen. Are you going to come straight home after the dance, or are you taking the girls out for a bite to eat? Well, the real fun begins after the dance is over. The kids all want to go down to the Blue Room. The Blue Room? Mm-hmm. Down at the lake? Yeah. Why, that place will cost a fortune. Do you think I'm made of money? 
Well, gee, Dad, it's the big dance of the year. You gotta do something special. Well, that's why I've been saving my allowance. Oh, you have enough? Well, almost. I, uh, I thought maybe you could lend me a little bit. Oh, you did. I supply the car, plus your allowance, and you expect me to let you have some more. Who's doing the courting? You or my pocketbook? When I was your age, a dollar was a lot, and five dollars was plenty for the junior prom. Well, things are different now. Besides, I'm only doing what the rest of the gang does. I'm sorry. You and your friends will have to think of something else to do. Something sensible. Jimmy and his father look at the question of using the car and spending money from different points of view. True, Jimmy needs an opportunity to prove that he can carry responsibility. But on the other hand, he's been negligent in the past. In different homes, different problems arise. Jane's date, Dick, thinks his greatest problem is his mother. Hi, Mom. Sorry I'm late. What's for dinner? Some good liver and bacon. Warmed over, though. You're very late tonight. Anything happen at the store? Don't forget your vitamins. Oh, liver. Vitamins. Sounds like a doctor's prescription. Well, you should have liver at least once a week. You need vitamins, too. I know. You tell me that every day. Where's Pop? He had to go out on a call again. I wish you wouldn't work so hard, Dick. You have too full a schedule. Oh, my, I do not. I'm doing okay. Well, you're trying to do too much, Dickie. What with your job, your schoolwork, going out to parties and dances and seeing your friends. It's just too much for you. I wish you'd quit that job. Oh, Ma, I'm doing okay. Why do you worry all the time? I'm not a baby. Of course you're not. But you're not grown up either. Now, do drink your milk. I wish you'd quit that job. It's just too much for you. I like my job. It gives me some money of my own. You know, for like after the school dances. You know Dad would yell if I asked him for some money to go to the Blue Room. The Blue Room? That's no place for young people. Why not? We're old enough. The whole gang's going. But you work so hard to save, Dick. You can't afford to let money slip through your fingers. And I won't have you staying out all night ruining your health. Oh, stay out all night, ruin my health, throw my money away. Can't I do anything? Look, I'm old enough to take care of myself. I won't leave you alone, and I won't have you ruining your health. Not after all I've gone through with you. You were such a sickly baby. Oh, for goodness sakes, Mom, I'm not a baby anymore. Sometimes it seems hard to convince parents that you're growing up. But on the other hand, young people easily forget that for the greater part of their lives, they've been completely dependent upon their mothers. Growing up is a long process with many ups and downs. Like Dick, many children have gone through long periods of illness, from measles and chicken pox to upset stomachs and earaches and growing troubles of one kind or another. And so it is perfectly natural for Dick's mother to continue to protect him and it's perfectly natural for Dick to assert his desire for independence. What is the answer? There is no one answer. Dick and his mother may have to face it that parents and children sometimes look at the same situation from opposing sides. But let's leave Dick's home and see why Dick's date, Jane, expressed so much concern about her parents. I don't see why I can't go to the movies tomorrow night. We discussed that at dinner because it's a school night. You know the rules about school night. Rules, rules, rules. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can never do anything. Oh, that's not true, and you know it. You've got a big weekend coming up at the class stand. We gave you permission to go to that. You'd have to be ogres to keep me from that. Well, we're not ogres, and we wouldn't keep you from it. But your daddy said to tell you to be sure to be in by 12. 12? I can't be in by then. I'll be the only one who can't go. Go where? You are going. Not to the dance, to the blue room afterwards. Remember the kids that came to my party last year? Well, we're all going together in two cars. I can't be in by then. I'm sorry, Jane, but your daddy says that 12 is the limit. That's right, young lady, 12 o'clock. That's plenty late for a girl your age. And if you can't be in by 12 o'clock, just forget the whole thing. But father, all the other girls I have been I am watching. not interested in what others do. In my house, I make the rules. Oh, I might have known. Nobody else's parents are as strict as you are. <laughs> Poor Jane, she's really upset. Of course, she doesn't know that her friends aren't doing any better, even though they could put up a longer fight. 
Jane's father is rather strict. But there's a reason behind it. He was brought up this way, obeying his elders, never questioning their commands. And he lived a happy and successful life. You can hardly blame him for trying to raise his family in the same spirit. But Jane resents it. She wants to live her own life, a life similar to those of her friends. Jane is torn by conflict how to show respect for her parents and still have the right to live her own life as a full member of the family team. Some families achieve this feeling of teamwork at the conference table. The Smiths hold a family conference every few weeks to discuss budgets and allowances and other problems of mutual concern. And when special problems come up, they hold a special family conference to work it out together. Where does that leave us, Glenn? Well, I guess that does it. $25. Now, how much of that do you two think you should have for this one night? Not $20, I suppose. Well, any other suggestions? Gee, Glenn, I guess we're out. We better tell the others right away. Well, there must be something you can do that's fun, just a little more practical. Well, what are some of the alternatives? Well, the high school hangout closes at 10 o'clock, so that's out. There's the Paradise Cafe and the all-night cafeteria and the drive-ins. I guess they aren't very exciting, are they? Are any of the girls having parties at their house? Yes, but there's nothing to do. It's the same old thing. We want to do something special. Well, of course you do, but couldn't we make it special? Sure, special food, music, maybe favors or decorations. Well, sure, fine. Listen, now, I have an idea. Could you leave it to a group of us parents just this once? Trust us to make it a special party? Either. Hey, this suits me fine. Me too. I can just hear my old man's groans as he went up the ladder. <laughs> just so he doesn't hear you call him old. Oh, they're not so old, really. But they're so unpredictable. Yes, unpredictable from Jane's point of view. Just as she is from theirs. But once the young adults understand that their parents are people, people with habits, moods, and a right to live their own life, and when the parents realize how important it is for the young adults to manage their own affairs, then they can deal with each other as mutually respecting individuals. And their relationships will be healthier and happier. Everyone is aware that the differences between the sexes go beyond obvious physical factors. For example, there is the difference in muscular strength. Automatically, the man will do any heavy work that needs to be done. Both the girl and boy understand that he is better equipped for such work than she is. They also realize that there is a difference in the roles which society expects them to play. And so, she will be sympathetic if he is hurt. But she realizes, as well as he does, that men aren't expected to fuss over a little pain the way a woman might. 
Seldom do such mutually acknowledged differences lead to problems. But many misunderstandings might be avoided if young couples were aware that there are other ways in which the sexes differ. Psychological and emotional ways which may be subtle, but are nevertheless important in any man-woman relationship. For instance, Jane doesn't know that she has a different attitude toward people than Jim has. She hasn't been going with him long enough for her way to clash with his. But to understand her way, you should see it in action. Not long ago, Jane had a problem involving a friend who frankly didn't bathe as often as she should. This is how Jane handled it. Hi, Gwen. Hi, Jane. Oh, uh, Gwen. Yeah? Last time we had Jim, I ran out of deodorant. I was going to borrow some from you. And I saw you didn't have any in your basket either. So since I had to get some for myself, I got some for you, okay? It's supposed to be real good. But you have to use it every day, after your shower. All right, I'll try it. Indirectly and subtly, using a roundabout method, Jane tries to get her point across in a woman's way. And if she hadn't gotten it across this time, she'd have tried something else, equally indirect. But the last method she would think of would be a direct or blunt way that might hurt Gwen's feelings. Now let's see how a similar problem might be handled by how Jim. You? Yeah, if he thinks he's going to overlook the rule about taking a shower at this time, the treatment. I'm for that. The air in this school's as much ours as it is his. He's polluting it, and that's going to come to a screeching halt. I have to sit beside him in history next hour. Hi, fellas. Well, I practice that hook shot so long I don't have time to take a shower. <laughs> Next time you have to be told to take a shower, we may be forced to get a little rough. <laughs> Direct action. That's the man's approach. The one Jim and other men understand. Even the fellow whose feelings are most directly involved. There's another difference between the sexes which can be used to illustrate the gulfs that must be bridged before a girl and boy really understand each other. And that difference lies in their temperaments. You ready for your surprise? Okay, dessert. First, shut your eyes. I bet you didn't even know I knew today was your birthday. Gosh, no. Thanks. <laughs> What's the matter? Oh, nothing. I just sort of thought you might want to save it. It was a souvenir of the first time we celebrated your birthday together. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. In general, women place much more importance on romantic symbols. Men, on the other hand, generally have to work at being romantic, remembering birthdays and anniversaries, surprising their wives and sweethearts with little gifts. We know that Jane is romantic and sensitive to other people's feelings. Well, she is equally sensitive about herself. Touchy is the word a man might use when it comes to interpreting a harmless remark as one that is directed personally toward her. Jane? Hmm? What do you think of that new girl, Susan... What's her name? McCarty. I don't know. I don't know her very well yet. Why? Oh, I was just wondering if she was going to fit in, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I do a little. She seems sort of standoffish. Except at the table. Wow, how she eats. Stuffing it in, smacking, making all kinds of noise. You'd think she'd know better. Okay, Gwen. Well, I can take a hint. By making noise eating, why don't you just say so? Jane personalizes comments immediately saying to herself, am I like that? And since she is human and quite likely to be like that, she assumes the comment was really meant for her, even though such a thought was far from Gwen's mind. And how about Jim? 
Is he likely to be different from Jane in this matter of applying general comments to himself? Let's see. As far as I'm concerned, Tolliver's out. I don't want him on a double date, particularly the awards banquet. We're not slated to get any awards, but Tolliver will. He's a whiz. Well, so what? He's a slob. His clothes look like he spilled half his dinner on him. Just what I've been saying. Tolliver's out. Men usually do not take general comments personally. That's Tolliver to a T, Jim says, and it never occurs to him that general remarks may have been aimed at him. And of course, they were not. When Jim, direct in dealing with others, is paired off with Jane with her typically female qualities of being indirect, romantic, and subjective, life may not always be the picnic it is at the moment. And that's why I have to be home by six. Big family get together. All the grandparents invited over. Boy, my mom's really making a big production out of my birthday. <laughs> and I'd just as soon spend the evening with you. There'll be other evenings. Your mother will be disappointed if you're late. Why don't you come with me? We can call your mother from my house. But Jim, I can't. I'm not dressed for a party. You look swell to me. Come on. But Jim, I haven't been invited. What would your mother think? What do you mean you haven't been invited? I invited you. I can't just walk in on her at the last minute. She'd have table arrangements to do over again, everything. She won't care. Come on. Jim, I can't. She will, too, care if someone comes in who isn't expected. Besides, I don't have time to get ready, and I can't let your folks see me like this on a special occasion. What's so special? I've had lots of birthdays. What's special is not really the occasion so much as it is what people will think. Girls must be continuously aware of the impression their actions or appearance might create. Things a fellow can get by with won't do for his girl. Men should be aware that this attitude of society creates problems for women and indirectly for the men who love them. If we could go with Jane and Jim into the future, supposing that their attraction to each other develops into love and they are married, we could see how misunderstandings based on the differences between the sexes might affect them. Say, I saw Bill Noble as I was leaving the office. He wants to look at those plans I've been working on here at home. He and Lil are going out tonight, and he said they'd come by and get them. Oh, no. I've ironed all day. The house is a mess. Relax. They're only going to be here a minute. Relax? When you're always pulling some horrible surprise on me. Oh, Jim, why can't you give me enough notice to get ready when you invite people over? I didn't invite them. Jim didn't invite them. But he or any man is inviting trouble when he ignores the importance to a woman of what people will think. To look at the other side of the coin, Jane is inviting unnecessary problems by ignoring some facts about men. From what you know of a man's reaction to the indirect approach, see if you think Jim is going to be able to fathom what Jane is driving at. Jim, dear, I noticed a new kind of electric shaver downtown. Supposed to be twice as fast as using a razor. You could zip right over your beard before breakfast. Thought I might get you one. Oh, I wouldn't be interested, Jane. I want a close shave. I don't care how long it takes. But Jim, honey, if it saved enough time so that you could shave before breakfast, wouldn't that... Coffee tastes bitter this morning. Besides, I've barely got time to shave. Oh, man. Well, does getting along with members of your own sex help you understand the opposite sex? Did experience with other fellows give Jim a hint that when a woman is just chattering, she may be trying to tell him something? Trying to say, I wish you'd shave before breakfast? Did getting along with other girls help Jane understand that when Jim pushed away the coffee, all he meant was, I don't like the coffee, not, I don't like you? But to get back to the picnic and Jim's bewilderment because Jane won't go with him to a birthday dinner because of the way she looks when it's his birthday. To get back to Jane's reaction to the masculine surprise that's been sprung on her. A misunderstanding exists here because each persists in expecting a reaction from the other that one should expect only from someone of his own sex. 
I just don't understand the way you're acting. No use even talking to you. Jane's wrong there. The way to avoid the difficulties that can arise from the differences between the sexes is to face up to these differences and to talk them over. And as for other differences that may exist, well, you'll know that you've probably discovered one any time you feel like saying to a boyfriend or girlfriend. Oh, women. Oh, men. Such exasperating moments usually come up because young people have never tried to face up to some of the psychological and emotional differences between the sexes. So what about you? What examples from your own experience illustrate other differences in masculine and feminine attitudes or behaviors? Now is the time to talk over these differences between the sexes, to begin to go your half of the way toward the difficult business of understanding someone different from yourself. I'm Mike Robinson. This is Sally Andrews. We're here to talk to you about good looks. Now, a lot of people think that good looks are something you have to be born with. That's not true at all. Just to make the point, let's approach the subject from the negative side. What are some of the things people do to spoil their looks, especially in the eyes of the opposite sex? For instance, what are some of the things we fellows don't like about the way some girls look? Boys couldn't care less for the girl with makeup that looks as if it were laid on with a trowel. Or the girl with nails that look like they belong on something out of a science fiction. Boys don't care much either for girls who are so overdressed and overloaded with jewelry that they look like they're on their way to a costume ball. The girls with charm bracelets that drown out the conversation aren't exactly in demand pores he has all over his body. Well, some people have the idea you only perspire under the arms. This isn't so. We perspire all over. Now, when perspiration is first given off by the body, it has no odor. The unpleasant odor is manufactured when the skin bacteria go to work on the perspiration. So the idea is to get rid of as many of these bacteria as possible. It used to be that any soap you use would leave thousands of them on your skin. Sort of like this. But now, if you use a good deodorant soap, one containing a germ-destroying ingredient in your daily bath, you get rid of most of these bacteria. In other words, you remove the cause of that odor, so there can be no effect. So that's rule one. A daily bath or shower is an absolute necessity for everyone. Not only for getting the dirt off, but to keep yourself sweet smelling. And fit to mingle with your neighbors. <laughs> we'll have one of our young friends give us a demonstration. Don't spare the lather. Remember, besides keeping you fresh, a good deodorant soap will also help keep your skin free of bacteria that can cause blemishes to spread. Use a body brush on your back and shoulders. That's where oily skin can leave pimples and blackheads. Scrub the elbows and knees thoroughly, and the heels. Be sure you rinse thoroughly to get all the soap off your skin. Always use a good underarm antiperspirant to keep you dry where you perspire most freely. Men exercise more and perspire more freely. Our clothing is heavier and less porous, so those odors cling. Therefore, men have even more reason than girls to bathe daily with a deodorant soap. 
A fellow can offend very easily without even knowing it. Don't take the chance. It isn't worth it. And use a hand brush on your fingernails before you get out of the shower. It's a good idea to make sure your hands and nails are as clean as the rest of your body. Well, now that we've covered the fine points of getting clean in the daily bath, what's next? I've got a few more things to show the boys. See you later. All right. I'll join the girls. What do you know about washing your face, Mary? Well, what's to know? Well, more than you might think. You have a hairband. Now you need a clean washcloth, time to do the job right, and... Don't tell me I know. Soap. That's right. And a good deodorant soap with a germ-destroying ingredient is very beneficial to complexions. What do I do now? Just wash my face? But it's a good idea to splash your face with hot water first, Mary. It opens the pores. Splash it thoroughly until your face is wet and soft. Take the washcloth and work up a good lather. Now rub the skin evenly and gently in a circular motion. No, don't rub downwards. Always work upward. Pay particular attention to the areas under the lower lip, on either side of the nose, around the nostrils, and on your forehead between your eyes. Now be especially gentle around the eyes. The skin muscles in these areas are very delicate and should not be stretched. Be sure to wash clear over the hairline. Be firm but gentle. The entire process should take between two and five minutes. That long? Just to get my face clean? It takes longer than most people realize. Now rinse off the soap with warm water. Then follow with a cold water rinse. May I have a towel, please? Thank you. Don't rub your skin, Mary. Blot it. Blot upwards. It helps to keep face muscles strong and your skin smooth and firm. That's right, Dave. Pay special attention to the sides of the nose and chin. That's where a lot of skin trouble starts. Use that washcloth. You have to scrub a little to get out the dirt and bacteria that's caught in the pores. You should wash your face like this at least twice a day. Maybe even more if your skin is especially oily. Now, that's fine. Now, rinse thoroughly with warm, clean water. Make sure you get all the soap off. Hey, I got soap in my eye. You'll live through it. Rinse it out. Now, I always finish off with a good splashing of cold water. Try it. Makes you feel good. Also closes up the pores. Now, that's fine. Now, dry your face. You can uh, put a little aftershave lotion on your face if you like. The alcohol in it helps dry up any pimples or sore spots you might have on your face. That's right. There's one thing to remember before you ever put on any makeup, Mary. That's to put on as little as possible. A touch of eyebrow pencil and lipstick is fine, but be subtle. And whenever you're in doubt, use less. Now, your eyebrow pencil should be neither needle sharp nor so dull that it draws a heavy line. You want that natural effect. Brush your brows up and smooth them across the top of the arch. Now, with your pencil, fill in with short hair-like strokes to strengthen the natural line. A lipstick brush serves two very important purposes. It gives your lips a well-defined line and helps stop lipstick smearing. Rest your little finger on your chin for steadiness. Part your lips slightly. Now outline your mouth.
then simply fill in the rest. That's perfect, Mary. Many girls don't realize that too much makeup only makes them look cheap and common. You used only enough makeup to emphasize your natural charm and freshness. Help, I'm drowning. <laughs> no, you're not, Peggy. You're just getting a good soaking. If you want soft, good-looking hair, you have to shampoo it regularly and properly. There. That's nice and wet. Now, you do it. Work up lots of foamy lather. Give your scalp a good hard massage. It's good for circulation. Don't use your nails, though. Just the tips of your fingers. Then when you've done a good, thorough job, rinse well and start all over again. Some people say you should always continue your lathering, rubbing, and rinsing until your hair squeaks when pulled between your fingers. Hear that squeak? But don't let it fool you. It just means your hair is getting close to being perfectly clean and you should rinse it again. Some girls tend to overdo the suds, use too much shampoo, and seldom get it all rinsed out. That's the idea, Peggy. Squeeze out all the excess moisture. Whenever you can, it's a good idea to dry your hair in the sun. No, don't rub your hair. Always blot it. Blotting keeps it from snarling. That's it. Everyone should shampoo his hair at least once a week, Brian. Just running shower water never gets the dirt out. It does feel a lot cleaner after that shampoo. Hey, it looks like I've got some dandruff. Oh, that's probably just scale, formed by a dead cell lapping off, just as they do everywhere else on the skin. An antiseptic shampoo cleans up some kinds of dandruff. Some hair tonics have anti-dandruff ingredients, too. Is this right? That's just right. When you brush with your head down, the scalp and hair are kept healthy by the circulation of blood to the scalp. But my arms are getting tired. It's better to brush too much than too little. Brush up. That's it. From the roots of the hair to the ends. There's nothing that responds so quickly to good care as your hair. Look at all the hair that's coming out. You lose some every day. That's an accumulation of dead hair you've been carrying around. Now, how would you like to look at a few different hairstyles to see which one best suits you? That sounds like fun. Just look into the mirror. Maybe we can find just the right hairstyle for your face. Bangs are good for long faces. They cut the length of the face and soften facial contours. Square faces usually need loose, soft hairdos to cushion sharp facial lines. Heart-shaped or triangular faces seem to look best when the hair is worn fairly long. Inverted triangle faces are most interesting with a sleek, simple style, worn long to soften the jawline. Round faces call for a part on one side to modify the roundness. Oval faces are perfect for a large variety of styles, if they're simple and flatter your features. They can be casual or sophisticated long or short. Oh, I like this style. All any girl has to do is to find a style that's just right for the shape of her face and one that is simple and easy to keep neat. Well, we've covered a lot of territory in a few minutes, haven't we? We certainly have. It's our turn now, girls. Let's see some of the things girls don't like about the way some boys look. Don't be too hard on the fellow, Sally. <laughs> don't worry. It's all in fun. Well, girls aren't exactly fascinated by the oddball haircut some boys get, or boys who just don't get any haircut at all. And there's nothing that will make a boy more ridiculous looking than flashy clothes and loud colors in shirts and neckties. And 
boys should keep in mind that hands and nails need a little work done on them after catching footballs or working on a dirty automobile engine. You can see it's just as important for boys to have the clean look as it is for girls. <laughs> well, Sally, who won? The boys or the girls? I guess we'll have to admit to a tie. Unless, of course, you'd like to see some more. Uh, no, 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 that's enough. Well, we'll just call it even. <laughs> now, let's summarize how anyone can have good looks by seeing how easy it is to have the clean look. We showed you how to take care of the perspiration odor problem with a good deodorant soap. In washing your face, take plenty of time to get your face perfectly clean. And remember the fine points of shampooing? Massage thoroughly with the tips of your fingers and rinse out all the soap. And don't forget, it takes plenty of brushing to make your hair good looking and healthy. In makeup, don't cover up your charm. Just use enough to emphasize the clean, natural look that is so attractive. Before we go, we'd like to leave you with just a couple of thoughts. It's a good idea for each and every one of us to stop and take a kind of personal inventory every once in a while, and then take whatever steps we have to, to keep ourselves as attractive as we all want to be. We are the keepers of our own good looks. It takes work, but it's worth it. Yes, sir. Just as quickly as you can say hickory stick, you'll be back at your old familiar stand at the school steps, putting in class time again, meeting old friends, or swapping stories around the Coke bar, and planning for the freshman frolic and the junior hop, taking detailed mental notes on the exciting new clothes that are as prevalent in the autumn on every high school campus as bright fallen leaves. Even boys in the teenage club are trying their own hand at wall designing, if not fashion designing. All that will be left of summer is that bottle of Coke in your hand. The same good refreshing Coke that's the pause that refreshes that you love in December just as you did in May. As every young girl knows, a whole new wardrobe of skirts and jackets and sweaters and blouses is as essential to going back to school as is a notebook and a fountain pen. The big difference is that shopping for skirts and blouses is a lot more fun than shopping for school supplies. In your high school class, you'll be wearing Roje blouses of Wamsutta fabric or Pettitine dresses fashioned of Wamsutta fabric for the very special possession of teenagers between 10 and 14 years old. Wamsutta blouse display, unanimously a sympathetic understanding of how teenagers feel about fashion. You'll want several blouses, with such pretty, silly details as ruffled yokes and little sleeves, twin collars and softly rounded shoulders. Wamsutta Mills and Roger does them all to a turn. On the first day of class, expect to see and to wear some of the most beautiful derby sportswear, tweed, plaid and flannel skirts you've seen since you've been old enough to care about clothes. Derby sportswear skirts this year are size to height. Now this means that Derby manufactures three distinct separate lengths in every size. One for the average height girl, one for the shorter girl, and one for the taller girl too. Think how happy mother and dad will be when they find out it isn't necessary to alter a thing. Because the skirts you buy fit you now exactly. Derby sportswear skirts are gently flared, several of them are in full swing. They also make all the youngest, freshest, prettiest fashion points of the season. Their pleats and panels and buttons in profusion. Can you top this? Of course you can. With sweaters which are created by Jane Irwell of botany brand Pure Wool or French Angora or Soft Australian Zephyr. You teenagers, as everybody knows, were this country's original sweater girls. And we know we can leave it to you and to Jane Irwell proudly to maintain that reputation. 
There's a Jane Irwell sweater designed to live in for every last engagement on your crowded calendar. Now, thanks to Wamsutta Mills, the all-American kid sister is no longer fashion's forgotten woman. For petitine dresses are styled with enough sophistication to delight the heart of the most worldly 13-year-old in junior high school. And they're cut with the kind of know-how that makes her young and still rather bulky figure seem more trim and shapely than it really is. Of course, Derby Sportswear makes slacks, too, which are cut so well that you'll wish you could parade them proudly into class. No costume, no matter how good it is, though, can be complete without the right pair of gloves. To go without gloves, as you know, is like getting all dressed up and then clean forgetting to put on lipstick. And the right pair of gloves, always without exception, is a pair of Founds gloves. On campus for long walks from class this winter, you'll want to wear a brief, warm, derby gray wool coat, uh, perhaps over a red and black shadow skirt. Or with a young Betmar beret and a camel's hair color jacket, spiced at the pocket with a gay emblem and having the same kind of leather buttons you used to admire so much on your older brother's polo coat. And what girl would not yearn for this beautifully coordinated group of separates by Derby, in which the corduroy jacket is lined with the very same plaid of the jumper and skirt? It's just the kind of outfit which pays extravagant compliments to a young girl's ingenuity and gives her a golden opportunity to put to use all the good fashion principles she knows. She can mix and match to her heart's content. She can wear the jacket with the skirt one day and vary it with the slacks the next. And then sometimes she will displace the gay plaid skirt with another blouse in the very same ripe plum color as the plummet straight jacket. And corduroy will be at the top of the class this year. Nearly every day in your high school class, you'll be wearing Wamsutta blouses. The skirts are made by Derby Sportswear. And the blouses are fashioned by Roger of Wamsutta Mills Extra Fine Cotton Broadcloth. Derby makes a skirt with a detachable panel, which when removed and thrown across the shoulders becomes a perfect stall. Delicious, huh? And of course, Derby's plaid jumper is a fashion indispensable for every high school miss. It will take to every last one of your Wamsutta blouses and your Jane Herbal sweaters with absolute good taste. College co-eds go for the suits and separates of Dan Gertzman of California as eagerly as they go for lemon cokes and fraternity pins. Now why? Because co-eds are as bright as the clothes they wear and they know good things when they see them. Of course, no semester in any high school or college in America can well begin until every girl, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, has selected her new store of Jane Irwell sweaters which are made invariably of soft, luscious botany brand yarn. Dan Gertzman of California combines in-the-know collegiate styling with wonderful Botany brand fabrics in colors which only botany dye experts can produce. And no fashion canny co-ed will rest happily until she gives her latest Roger blouse a full set of Dan Gertzman separates, whether it's the tweed or this bold plaid with the big patch pockets. This fall, you will find jaunty jackets and skirts in every mode, as well as these Jane Irwell sweater sets. Isn't that cute? Now you can take you can take the jackets closely fitted or loosely boxed, short or slightly longer, whichever you prefer. Underline your jacket by all means with a checked or plaid skirt. Count on Gertzman too for the expensive details you cherish in your tailored clothes. On many college campuses, young men as well as young women study, have fun, fall in love, 
And take it from a boy, girls, the fellows on the campus are every bit as wardrobe conscious as this girl is in her Jane Irwell sweater and her Dan Gertzman skirt. They're both of Botany brand yarn. A college Joe insists on smart clothes, certainly, but he's too smart to want to look like a comic strip Sharpie, so he chooses Eagle brand clothes every time. He wears one whether he's trying to beat the bell to a 10 o'clock class or talking leisurely to his best girl in her bet Marbure in her smart suit. The jacket is made of such beautiful, soft, flecked tweed as has not been seen around until this very autumn. The skirt in lighter gray carries out the tone-on-tone -tone theme that is so popular this season. The Eagle Brand clothes take their cues from the modern man's action way of life. So they choose an Eagle Brand suit every time. Women's fashions, just like women themselves, have been strongly influenced by the men. And now Dan Gertzman creates a modern translation for the college girl of a man's old English Norfolk jacket. In glove language, Found's pigskin are at the top of the class and are made from the hides of wild South American pigs. Eagle Brand suits are just right, because they're as comfortable as his favorite easy chair, even the first time a fellow puts one on. Whether the suit is double-breasted or single-breasted, they fit the bill. And to meet her boyfriend on crisp afternoons, a college girl wears a notched collar, double-breasted tweed suit with a pleated skirt in the color of ripe raspberry. And an Eagle Brand men's gabardine top coat looks as good in action as it does in still life. Leave it to the boys not to miss out on a good deal like Found's driving gloves. They're made of warm, pure wool with pigskin palms. Why, a man can even stuff all his classroom notes in his inside pockets. And because of Eagle's lounge construction, his jacket puts up nevertheless a fine, smooth front. And notice, too, how an Eagle lounge model suit gives a guy a chesty, athletic appearance. The various Eagle brand coat and suit models embody everything that is meant by the word smart. The styles are neither extreme nor conservative, but follow a progressive path of leadership. The former type of garments, which look neat when tried on in the store, had a tendency to go out of shape in the front and pull away from the chest when pocket stuffing began. But the new lounge model gives men a taller, slimmer look. Once a man experiences the comfort and neater appearance of the lounge model, he never wants to go back to the old style. It means whether standing, walking, or sitting, the suit will feel comfortable without binding. Now, to go to the first football game of the season, the girls move right back into Dan Gertzman's separates because they're as gay and as colorful and as wonderfully informal as the stadium itself. As always, their well-dressed escorts wear eagle coats perhaps of rich brown velour with a very sporty wraparound. A co-ed might prefer a beautiful blue tone-on-tone -tone cardigan suit, which blends perfectly with her Bose single-breasted blue check top coat. A man lucky enough to own a convertible naturally has in his wardrobe a fine gabardine top coat that shows off the same advanced guard streamlining as his car does. A smart college girl, you for instance, drive home for the weekend in a coordinated three-piece sports ensemble perfectly designed by Adele of California in her own inimitable West Coast fashion. Or it might be a short, close-fitting jacket of striped worsted with a new poker straight skirt. And over it, when the night winds blow, or if you want to take down the top on a sunny afternoon, you'll wear a flawlessly cut longer coat. Coro Jewelry puts the perfect finishing touch to all the costumes in this picture, as well as to this one by Adele of California. It's a long jacketed suit, fashioned of plaid suiting, whose incredibly soft touch must be experienced to be wholly believed. And the same with this worsted striped suit, margined with bright gabardine at the collar, cuffs, and buttonholes. For extracurricular activities like going on a field trip or to the Dean's Tea, a co-ed exchanges her sweater and skirt for a David Crystal dress. Now take it from David Crystal. Wool plaid and velvet 
will be just about the handsomest couple fashion-wise on any American campus this fall. Or you may choose instead tissue sheer corduroy casuals with fullish skirts that will take a very fast walk across the campus in their easy long-legged strides. Corduroy this year is softer and prettier than it has ever been before. And David Crystal dyes it in such jewel colors as were seen only previously in pure silk. But neither college girls nor college Joes spend all their time in class. They like a rowboat or a drive in the country on Saturday afternoons. And David Crystal knows enough about women to give them precisely the clothes they need for the lives they lead. The bright colors, the flawless fit, the imagination and invention, and the fresh new details of styling they love. David Crystal understands that co-eds need clothes that will take them from the campus lake to dinner in town and look as if they were made expressly for either locale. The dresses take to accessory changes as well as they take to changes of scene. To fill the picture, Botany brand fabrics are as essential to a college girl's scheme of things as is this cocoa colored jacket and skirt from Nardis of Dallas, which you can spike beautifully with bright yellow accessories, such as a Jane Irwell sweater, and Founds gloves, which, for your identification, are trademark doets. Every girl knows she can count on her botany made clothes. This Judy and Jill red and gray suit, for instance, she'll freely expose to the elements of winter, spring, and fall. Because they're warm, but not too warm, light, but not too light, and they're always beautiful. Now take this Nardis of Dallas green dress, for instance. It's a perfect back-to-college number. It's good under a winter coat, fine for early spring without a wrap at all. These fresh flower colors are, as you can plainly see, eminently worthy of Technicolor. But the Pussy Willow soft texture of botany fabrics is something to which even Technicolor cannot yet do full justice. Botany brand fabrics fashion every kind of garment under the sun, from suits and separates to sweaters and slacks. These fit into a college girl's weekend life as neatly as they fit a college girl. And slacks like these are a fine safety value to help preserve your wardrobe. Designed to be lived in is not just idle chatter. These sophisticated Jane Irwell sweaters demonstrate they provide a perfect upper story for Dan Gertzman's skirts. When you return to classes, it'll be too warm to wear a brief coat and not warm enough for summer cotton. But the weather in the fall is wonderful skirt and sweater time. Moreover, with a switch of skirts and with the addition or subtraction of a colorful silk scarf, you can make a couple of sets of separates look like a baker's dozen. Selenese is to silk and satin and shining file as botany brand is to flannel and wool. At a sorority rush, for instance, what could be sweeter than a gleaming slipper satin dress like one of these? Designed by Doris Varnum expressly for Jonathan Logan. Now, all of them have precisely the kind of styling that a fashion-wise young collegian covets for her dressed-up clothes. Little collars, cuffed small sleeves, smooth snug bodices, and big pockets on full skirts. Selenese has created fabrics in colors which rival the luster of precious stones. And Doris Varnum has molded these satins with a junior's pretty contours very well in mind. Coro's gleaming rhinestones match in their perfection Selenese satins. Coro pearls, worn as barrettes or chokers or bracelets, are the party kind of jewels that dresses like these love, as deeply as they love Doris Varnum's skillful manipulation of Selenese luxurious fabrics. When a co-ed takes a breath of air during a cocktail party, she looks as pretty as she did dancing. Tony Owen chooses smooth, wonderful, costly-looking Vernet file caprice crepe to fashion for her a white and gold evening blouse with a rolled collar and a deep plunging neckline. It was meant to be mated with Vernet's Indian Spice file caprice dinner-length evening skirt. On those very special occasions, when only a gown which touches the floor will do, a college girl often shuns too sugary organdy or net in favor of a slick, sophisticated job like Tony Owen's Vernet two-piece dress. It is perfectly fitted, 
has a brief jacket and a very full pleated skirt. Because coeds love to show their pretty shoulders, Young Modes creates a Vernet toffee fabric, an evening frock which has a strapless dress, which forms a peplum set with two rosettes in back. The bolero jacket has sleeves with flyaway cuffs. Another Young Modes evening frock has a very full skirt, which was made to swing and sway, and a simple, very fitted bodice. The tiny double-tiered jacket, also a Vernet toffee fabric, ends at a point far above the waist and has little buttons at the back. College girls love the soft, talking, whispering rustle of Vernet fabrics while they dance, and their best bows like it just as well as the girls do. Another Vernet, the name that stands for creative styling in fine fabrics. Vernet has a veteran's understanding of that will-o'-the-wisp thing called fashion, which means so much to women everywhere. They know that a fine fabric is the mother and father of every dress or blouse or skirt or suit. That's why Vernet devotes all its efforts and its whole talented staff to creative, imaginative, and timely new fabrics. Vernet believes that style is an artist's view of the world. And to prove it is this dress created by Joan Norton Irwin with its very own purse to match. Yes, Vernet's fabrics interpret to a T all the richness and elegance of the new season. Other Vernet fabrics are used by international dress company. Because Vernet fabrics are right, they serve as inspiration for all top designers. For the biggest parties of the fall semesters, a whole designer's workroom full of exciting new Celanese fabrics make their exclamation points again. Now, on such evenings, of course, everybody's best boyfriend will be handsomer than ever in an Eagle brand tuxedo which is constructed intelligently along the same lounge lines as Eagle Brand day clothes. That's why Eagle Brand tuxedos have the same comfortable at ease look. Every college girl's enormous preference for bare shoulders and tight bodices on big nights. Jonathan Logan's Doris Varnum takes it tenderly to heart. She cuts tiny shirt sleeves. Big Bertha collars, which managed to reveal anyhow a, a good expanse of naked territory in the pretty region of the throat. And Doris Varnum selects shimmering Celanese fabrics every time to create these fabulous party dresses. Nighttime brings sleep time, and warm sata super kale sheets and pillowcases bring absolute unparalleled bedtime luxury to a college girl's dormitory room. And Flaubert's robes, also made of warm sata fine cotton, are as fresh and pretty late at night as morning glories are at sunup. But girls will be girls, and they go to sleep, no doubt, to dream of the pretty costumes they'll wear tomorrow morning. policeman on the corner is a good symbol for law. Like the policeman, law directs us in doing the right things to live together in harmony. And law forbids us from doing the wrong things that tend to destroy that social harmony. But law is more than the policeman on the corner. More than the courthouse where our laws are enforced. More than the jail where lawbreakers are punished. Law is one of three forms of social control which regulate our daily lives. Custom, what we usually do. Moral code, what we should do. And law, what we must do. Now just how do these social controls affect us? Well, in the teen canteen in our town, we'll find part of the answer to that question. You see, the canteen is always busy early in the evening. But on weeknights, the crowd thins out gradually. So when the clock approaches closing time, things quiet down in a hurry. The club has its own laws as obey them. After closing time, you won't find anyone there, 
except for the three members whose turn it is to clean up. But did I say three? Just us, Betty? Aren't there always three on the cleanup committee? Yes. I wonder who's missing. If it's that Jack McGregor again. It is. I've heard he always ducks out early. It's bad enough with three to clean out, but only two. And he's supposed to be business manager of the canteen. You know, Betty, I'm going to bring this up at the business meeting tomorrow. I'll show that Jack McGregor. I meant to tell you, and Betty, honest, Jane. My dad insisted that I be in the house by 11 o'clock. Can't you explain to him? He wouldn't want you to run out on your responsibility, would he? Take it easy. We're not getting anywhere this way. Staying to clean up is a problem with a lot of us. Even though I'm the chairman of the canteen, I've had to skip cleanup duty to keep from being out too late. Say, maybe weeknights we ought to canteen earlier. You'll never get anyone to agree to that. I don't know. Maybe that is the answer. Tell you what. Let's meet again when we can have our advisors in to help us work this thing out. As you know, our civic association has been with you from the start. I believe I can speak for the association and as your advisor in recommending that it would be very wise for you to close the canteen on weeknights at 10.30 instead of 11. After all, that's customary in our town. The drug stores, the ice cream stores, most of the places of business are closed by that time and well, it seems to me that you might close, too. The theater stays open later than 11. But we're not a theater. Some people may question our behavior when we keep the canteen open till 11. I don't think it's right for us to stay out so late. Who's to say what's right? We know what's good for us. Nobody has to stay here till 11 just because the canteen is still open. There's no law that says you have to stay or you have to go. You're a lawyer, Mr. Parks. There's no law, is there? No, Jack, I don't think there is. Now. But I have heard people talking about your late hours here. You'd better realize that the town could pass a law which would compel you to close at 10.30, or 10, or even 9. You see, whatever the community decides is best for itself usually becomes law. A community? Well, aren't we part of the community? Well, of course you are, Jack. But thinking of the community as a whole... Well, I wouldn't like to see our town pass a curfew law, as some other towns have. Don't you think it would be better for the community, and for you, if the canteen were to pass its own law to close weeknights at 10.30? And so Jack is learning about social controls. It's customary, said Mrs. Brown. It's right, said Jane. It's the law, said Mr. Parks. Yes, they can all see how these social controls, custom, moral code, and law have always played a part in the activities of the teen canteen. Here, as in our general society, there are a great many customs, and we accept them. Customs of dressing, we're neat and clean. Customs of courtesy, we're thoughtful of others. What happens if we violate a custom? It isn't serious. Perhaps we simply lose a little prestige. Nevertheless, customs do control us. We make a habit of following them. And then there are moral codes, sometimes called the mores. These are society's standards about what we should and should not do. They are more deeply ingrained in us. We simply don't cheat in games. We in the society in which we live think that's the proper way. In the canteen, there's no drinking or gambling. That's in line with the moral code of this group. And what happens if we break the moral codes? Well, anyone who breaks these loses social status. He no longer belongs. He's an outcast. And then there's law. Let's return to that business meeting where a new law or rule has been under consideration. It seems we have four good reasons for setting the closing time of the canteen at 10.30 on weeknights. 
For the convenience of the cleanup committee, we need an earlier closing hour. Then there's the custom in the town. And some feel that it's not right for us to stay out late. Finally, we want to be sure that we stay within the laws of the town so that we can continue to govern ourselves without outside interference. With all these reasons, I'm sure the majority of canteen members will vote for 10.30 closing. What do you say? I think it's the only thing to do. I agree. Well, we're only advisors. You make your own laws. But I think you'll find that your new law is a good law. Law is a whole body of rules for our conduct made by representatives of the people and enforced by established means. We all know that there are many don'ts in the laws we make. Law prohibits what the majority decide is wrong. Law directs what is agreed to be right. Laws require you to go to school so that you and society will benefit. And laws provide the schools for you to attend. Thus, every day you come in contact with social controls, with custom, with moral code, and with law. Suppose this were you. What social controls affect you? Well, in your family, and your school, and your church. In your whole community, there are customs and moral codes which guide your actions. Many of these customs and mores are enacted into formal laws. The town or city in which you live has laws which control you. There are state laws passed and enforced by state governments. And the federal government, in your name, makes laws which affect you. And we are hopefully working toward a still higher level of law the law of nations united for world peace. You are guided by all these laws and controls. The new law for closing at 10.30 was agreed upon by a majority of the members of the teen canteen. It's a good law because it agrees with the customs, the moral codes, and the laws of this group and of this community. In a democracy, such laws and social controls belong to the people who live under them. These laws are yours to make wisely, to change intelligently, to understand and live by. And so, another job for the police and the courts. Johnny Marvin is now in the hands of the law. This is the first time he's been caught, but his delinquent tendencies began long before in the conflicts of an unhappy home and in the hangout of the gang which was his refuge. Now, what will become of this boy? 
What road lies ahead for this sullen, misguided 15-year-old? Will he be placed in a cell for the night, herded with drunks and criminals, then in the morning paraded in the police lineup? Will he be fingerprinted, photographed, given a permanent criminal record at 15? Will he be sentenced by a judge who knows nothing of the background of John and his family or the reasons behind his behavior? Will he grow up in reformatories and prisons to become a bitter and seasoned criminal? Johnny and 200,000 other youngsters who are arrested each year are America's number one crime problem. Can't something be done to help these twisted young lives and set them straight? Yes, something can be done. Something is being done. Many communities believe that good juvenile courts with well-organized probation service can make good citizens out of wayward youth. Fortunately, Johnny lives in a community which has such a court. After his arrest, he does not go to a jail to mingle with adult offenders. Instead, he is taken to a detention home, which the community maintains especially for children. Here he is placed in the care of a house mother and father who have been trained in this work. Kindly but firmly, they proceed to make him comfortable in spite of himself. He is given a bath and a pair of clean pajamas. He has a good night's rest in a comfortable bed. Next morning, after a nourishing breakfast, he's ready for a visit to the chief probation officer who handles incoming cases at the juvenile court. Haltingly, Johnny tells his story. The officer listens attentively and asks questions to bring out all the details. Then he sends him back to the detention home for a few days and assigns a probation officer to investigate his background. Why does Johnny behave as he does? It is probation officer Benton's job to find out. First, he makes a trip to Johnny's neighborhood, a visit to Johnny's world of squalid homes, dirt, and confusion. Here in the rear of a house, typical of the neighborhood, is where the Marvins live. Benton finds Mrs. Marvin and has a long talk with her. He learns that Johnny's father is dead, that she earns a little each week as a cleaning woman, and finds the task of raising her family too much for her. The boy was fond of his father, but he rebels against his tired, nagging mother, who finds it impossible to control him. He stays out late, prefers the gang to home. Benton investigates the gang because he's concerned about these boys too but he finds them suspicious and distrustful, unwilling to tell him anything about Johnny. He also has a talk with Johnny's teacher. He learns that though bright and popular with his classmates, the boy has a long record of truancy and poor schoolwork. Meanwhile, Johnny is sent to the clinic where he is given a thorough physical examination. Psychological tests reveal Johnny's special aptitudes as well as some of the probable reasons for his school failures. The probation officer's efforts to persuade Johnny himself to talk meet with some degree of success. He readily admits all the facts of his offense, but he's still distrustful of any efforts to help him. Then Johnny goes before the judge. In a good juvenile court, this is not a trial, but a quiet hearing conducted in a small room. Only Johnny, his mother, and the probation officer are present. The judge has studied the reports of the probation officer, the doctor, and the psychologist. And after talking with Johnny, Mrs. Marvin, and Mr. Benton, he reaches a decision. Well, Johnny, you're in a pretty serious situation. This isn't the first time you've stolen things. I can send you to the industrial school till you're 21. You know that, don't you? But I don't want to do that. But we believe, your mother and Mr. Benton and I, that you can make good without being sent away. So, I'm going to put you on probation. Mr. Benton will be your friend and supervisor. Now, we are going to help you all we can. But it's really your job. Will you try? 
Good. Mr. Benson, I want to know from time to time how Johnny gets along. And so Johnny is placed in the hands of a probation officer, a trained caseworker to whom the boy's problems are a challenge. The first step in planning for the boy's future is to become acquainted with him, to find out about his interests, his ambitions, his feelings about himself. At the same time, he begins to win the boy's respect and friendship. He must find a way to change Johnny's attitudes, to make him want to do the things which will bring him greater satisfaction than he has found in misbehaving. Benton has a talk with Johnny's mother, helps her to understand the needs of an adolescent boy. He asks the welfare agency to give financial help and assist Mrs. Marvin in making the home more attractive for her children. As the months pass, Benton sees Johnny frequently, sometimes at the community swimming pool. Johnny loves to swim. In the winter, Mr. Benton persuades him to go out for the school basketball team. And he is successful in getting him to go to church again. Sometimes they meet at Johnny's home where his willingness to help his mother is evidence of a new sense of responsibility. Discovering that Johnny's greatest interest is airplanes, Mr. Benton arranges with a friend of his who is a pilot to have Johnny meet him at the flying field. It was a never-to-be-forgotten experience for the boy. He was actually able to sit in a plane and have a real pilot tell him about the controls. Benton uses Johnny's desire to be an aviator to persuade the boy to better his schoolwork, for a pilot must have at least a high school education. He introduces Johnny to the public library where the boy devours books on aviation and to the boys' club, where he learns to build a model airplane in the club shop. This is fun, fascinating. Johnny has found a new world, an ambition. The gang is forgotten. He's looking ahead to the things he really wants. Intelligent and friendly guidance has accomplished what mere punishment could never do. After a year on probation, Johnny is again brought before the judge. Well, Johnny. Mr. Benton tells me you don't need probation anymore. You've made good. <laughs> I guess you won't steal any more automobiles, will you? Gee, that was dumb, wasn't it? It certainly was. <laughs> but we're all very proud of you now, Johnny. And I want to congratulate you. And so Johnny's probation is successful. His case is typical of the everyday achievements of good juvenile courts. Proper facilities, a judge who understands children, and carefully chosen probation officers can achieve the same results in any community. seem much different from others in his block. And yet it may well be that never in his life has he had the love and the care that most people would give to a pet. So 
Jeff has come to feel that the world is against him. A typical vandal? No. For people are never typical. Every person is different with inner motivations of his own, often not even known to himself. In Jeff's hidden personality are many scars and many open wounds. Their causes are not easy to understand. Perhaps his home is at fault. It's not that the dishes are dirty and the house is messy. It's something much deeper. Perhaps the emptiness of a home that is lacking in love and affection. Whatever it may be, Jeff Turner has become an outsider. Made so by complex circumstances which he himself can't fully control or understand. Even among others of his own age, Jeff often feels left out and uncomfortable. Oh, three ounces. Right. All right, somebody put him away. I'll, I'll do it. Oh, all right, Jeff. Now, that's a gain of three ounces over the day before yesterday. Can anyone suggest a cause? Wendy? It could be to the fat in the diet, Mr. Cole. Yes, yes, it could be. We have to consider that. But uh, what other causes might there be? Jeff? What? Do you have an idea? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, who can uh, think of other causes? Yes? Well, maybe is there Rightly or wrongly, well, Jeff has come to feel that everyone is against him. Outside, Jeff Turner is much like any boy on the block. But inside, he is eaten away with resentment and a desperate urge to get even. There are others at odds with the world, but for different reasons. Here is Don Cardiff. Folks have prodded and nagged at Don until, without knowing it, he hates them and himself as well. Daddy! You forgot your scars! Your scars! And Ed Berger is a product of poverty, made worse by the lack of family love and respect. Why don't you get out then? I'd have more money if you I could do it. You tell them to get out. Well, you're a fine one. You've never seen Yeah, Mr. Case is my teacher. Oh, right. Boy, he's so funny. Always, always great. These are city boys, but theirs is not only a city problem, nor are all who get involved in vandalism necessarily deeply disturbed. But wherever the natural warmth of human feeling has been turned to resentment by constant lack of affection and understanding, there is danger of vandalism. Something. Let's go to a movie or something. What's the plan? I don't know. Ah, what difference does it make? Let's do a movie. Hey, maybe I can get my old man's car. We can go for a ride. Can't get nobody to go with us. What's the fun? Sure we can. Sure we can get somebody. Like who? I don't know. Somebody. 
These are the seeds of vandalism, boredom and inner resentment, which lead to the destruction of property. This is more than a simple matter of keeping the hands busy. Many people are nervous and fidgety, but they seem to be able to control their actions so that they're not destructive. In these boys, feelings of resentment are too great to be controlled completely, even when they themselves are not fully aware of their feelings. Although they have no plans at the moment, these boys are headed for serious trouble before the evening is over. Can this trouble be avoided? How can vandalism be reduced? Can these boys be persuaded to take part in some community activity in order to help them get rid of boredom? Active boys clubs with strong leadership and community support might win their interest and keep them off the street. The community has a responsibility here, but so have the boys themselves. They have to be able to meet the club halfway. A club doesn't mean much if you won't join. Our schools, too, in their after-hours activities as well as in the classrooms, can do much in the fight against vandalism. The sympathetic interest of good teachers and counselors can do wonders in making the world seem less cold and hostile. A better understanding of right and wrong might steer these boys away from the direction they are heading. But the key to the problem is in the family. It is here that moral values are first implanted, to be nurtured until they put down roots. Family, friends, community institutions, all play their role in the complex process through which every personality develops into its own individual form. These boys, through many unhappy and painful experiences, have come to feel resentful toward everyone. Say, there's a free movie at the community center tonight. Ugh, those free movies. Yeah, anyway, it's always too crowded in there. <laughs> Their feeling isn't on the surface, and therefore it's hard to overcome even when the community makes the effort. Want to see the film tonight, fellas? No, we're kind of busy tonight. How about a little basketball? No. We've got plans. Well, come in any time. Yeah, sure, Mr. Brewer. Yeah. Social work. Boy, look at that. Looks more like a prison than a school. Yeah, sure it does. Hey, look. Look at that window. Say, don't. How about that? Let's look, take a look around. It might be fun, huh? You better not. It'd be too bad if they catch us. What's the matter? You scared? No, I'm not scared. Me neither. Oh, come on. It can't hurt anything. Oh. save these boys from doing things they'll be sorry for later. But guards can't solve the real problem. How to keep inner feeling up until they burst out in unexpected acts of destruction. Even so small a thing as an unlocked window may trigger an act of vandalism. Thank you. 
There's a rabbit in there. A white rabbit. Come on. My oh, heck, it's locked. Hey, wait a minute. My house key fits almost all the doors in the school. Let me try. There. There. Any abuse? Feel, feel how soft he is. Oh, I had one of those. They're kind of dumb. He likes me, see? See how he puts his nose up against me? Probably thinks you're a carrier or something. Mm, he sure is soft. Hey, look. Test papers. Your paper in here, Jeff? Wait. Yeah. I probably flunked. Say, how about that? Graded and everything. Yeah. Well, we can fix that. Here goes our old test. Ed! Cut it out! Why? We're just helping Jeff pass the test. Hey, hey, let me know. Look, you stay there. Boy, we'll miss it. Cold and sore when he sees this. This is how vandalism usually starts. Not planned. Nothing to be gained or achieved. Destruction has boiled up out of hidden resentments and strikes out blindly against everything in its path. for the shocking, appalling waste you've caused. But we know today there's more to it than that. You parents must share the responsibility, for somewhere along the line, you have failed your sons. You have failed to teach them moral value. <laughs> and by denying them the love, the security, and the sense of belonging, which is important to every living being, you have hurt them as surely as though you had denied them food. I know that there are other factors too. The school, the church, and the community all share in this important problem. But the basic fact remains that you three boys are yourselves responsible for your acts. Perhaps our doctors, our social workers, and others on our staff can help you overcome the fear and hate which has brought you before this court help you learn how to live a happy and normal life. Nevertheless, I have no choice but to sentence you. So ends another act of vandalism. An act of needless waste and destruction to all concerned. It's a pleasant afternoon in June. 
Mel and his best girl, Farah, are enjoying a ride. Well, he's enjoying it. She's not too happy about the way he drives. He's got a good car, and he likes to show what it can do. Hey, you're supposed to slow down for a school crossing. Mel doesn't slow down for anything. See that jalopy up ahead? Watch him pass it. These boys have their opinion of such big shots. Uh-oh. Perhaps Mel's not such a big shot after all. Here we go again. He's used to this. Paying a fine won't be any hardship for Mel. It doesn't mean a thing to a phony like that. Mel's determined to overtake the jalopy and cut the driver down to size. The man wants to know if Mel's going to compete or watch. Mel's going to do whatever that jalopy does, only better. Many boys like Mel were a public problem until the 1950s, someone had the idea of turning this abandoned airstrip into a legitimate test course for hot rods. Here, they compete under strict rules designed for safety and fair play. This strip at Santa Ana was so successful that others were opened up across the country. Hundreds of clubs have been formed. The hood lifters, the Arabs, throttle jammers, shifters, chaparrals, knuckle busters, clutchers club, dusters, sidewinders, and others with equally fanciful names. Automatic expulsion faces any member who races on the public highways. As a result, the juvenile nuisance problem has been reduced as much as 90% in some communities. Here's Mel and the jalopy. The flagger thinks Thera better get out. There they go. Sideline experts. Mel can't believe it, but it's happening. He's left behind. Far, far behind. He's humiliated and angry. His one thought is to find Thera and get away. There she is. Talking to the fella that just beat him. He's giving her his card. And she's taking it. This is the last straw. refuses to be impressed. His defeat by the jalopy was a challenge, a challenge he has accepted. He'll have some tall explaining to do about this heap of junk he's bringing home. He knows he can handle his folks. He's equally sure he can breeze through this job he's undertaken. In the next weeks, he learns a lot. 
The most important thing being how little he knows. He makes one trial run after another when nobody's around to see him fail. He cuts out when he gets up over a hundred and he can't figure why. He's too proud to ask for help, although he knows where he can get it. Farah gave him Dave's card. It's hard for him to pocket his pride. Besides, he's not at all sure of his welcome. Dave looks friendly enough. He'll chance it. Wow, what a motor. You've really got something here. Dave thinks Mel ought to enter the big timing meet. They think Mel could turn 150 miles per hour. He hasn't made 120 yet. That's because he needs new wiring and new plugs. Also, he should put in a third carburetor, install an alcohol system, and run on nitro. They'll be glad to help him. Their generosity astonishes Mel. He's joined the fraternity where the car's the thing. The two-day meet has started. Here at Lake El Mirage, the object is not to race car against car, but to see which can obtain the highest speed in its class. The event gives these boys an opportunity to test the cars they've modified for speed and general performance. Many contestants come and spend the night. Among them, Dave and Mel. There's one of the timing officials. He sees to it that safety is the keynote of these meets. Inspectors is rigid. Those that don't pass are eliminated. No boy under 16 is allowed to participate. Those under 21 must have their parents' written consent. Crash helmets are a must. As are safety belts. Accidents are few, but no car is allowed to start unless the ambulance is standing by at the finish line. Since daybreak, the starter has been sending out the cars. This streamliner is next. The loudspeaker tells him to get underway. Very few of these cars have self-starters. He's away! And up to speed as he enters the trap. He breaks the first light beam. Sets the timing machine in operation. He breaks the second light beam at the finish. The time is registered. Announced and recorded at the board under the starter stand. Car after car goes out. T Roadsters. Belly Tanks. Chopped Coops. Highest speed made today. 168.127 miles per hour. Car 138C, you're next. That's Mel. His hands tremble as he puts on his crash helmet. The official wishes him luck. 138C, take her out. He's on. The car fishtailed at the takeoff. 
but he stiff arms her back to the course. Phew, that was close. Hold her steady, Mel. He can see the reason for the safety belt now. Sweat's running down the back of his neck and his helmet weighs about a ton. This is no smooth concrete strip he's traveling. The dry lake bed is full of ruts and bumps. But he's in control now and beginning to enjoy the thrill of the run. He begins to drop off. Now he's in high and praying he'll get past 6,000 revolutions per minute going through the traps. There's the first marker up ahead, and the tachometer says 5,900, 5,950, 6,000. He's in the trap now at 6,500. The best he can do. He's out. His time. Car 138C turned at 151.06 miles per hour. The time is official. What a welcome awaits him back at the pits. Trophies now instead of traffic tickets. He'll never speed on the highway again. Nor will any of these others. For through this safe and constructive outlet, these boys satisfy their craving for knowledge and speed. Out of their ranks come the engineers who develop improvements for your car and mine, who create new designs and affect economies. These boys of today are the men of tomorrow. <laughs>